Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 560th New Social Environment. I'm Nick, the Director of Programs here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Neri Ward and Jessamyn Batario. We're thrilled to welcome the poet Benjamin Crustling here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter. Here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wapinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lene Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. So we encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. Today's conversation will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel, where you can view the full archive of this series. And now to introduce today's guest and host, Born in Jamaica, Neri Ward's work has been exhibited, exhibited at national and international venues and, and, and institutions, including the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston, the New Museum, MoMA PS1, the Venice Biennale, and many more. He is the recipient of awards such as the Vilcic Foundation Prize, the Joyce Award from the Joyce Foundation, and the Rome Prize from the American Academy of Rome. He currently resides in New York, where he teaches in the Department of Art and Art History at Hunter College, and his exhibition, I'll Take You There, A Proclamation, is on view at Lehman Maupin in New York uh, through June 4th. And our host today is art historian Jessamyn Batario, who specializes in modern and contemporary art. She received her PhD in art history from the University of Texas at Austin. Batario currently lives in Waterville, Maine, where she is the Lind Family Foundation Curator of Academic Engagement at the Colby College Museum of Art. She was the Brooklyn Rails uh, guest critic in March 2020, which we'll post a link to shortly. Um, but without further ado, over to you, Jessamine. Thanks so much, Nick. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks for joining us. I'm really excited today to be talking with Mary. Uh, as Nick said, I'm uh, joining you from Maine, which is uh, the ancestral lands of the Wabanaki. That includes the groups, the Abenaki, the Mi'kmaq, the Maliseet, the Penobscot, and the Passamaquoddy. Um, and I like saying this also because we are going to be talking about um, place and site, uh, which I think is really important to Neri's work. He's responding to, to his own environments. Um, uh, and that's what's on view at Lehman Maupin, at least that's what I took from it. And uh, so without further ado, really, Neri, I, I'd love uh, if we can get a chance to take a look at the images and we can share the work with others here. Um, and perhaps you can uh, walk us through what's on view and I'll just uh, pepper in with some questions for you. Great, um, just a minute, thank you. It's great to be here in conversation with you. Thanks for taking the time. Um, yeah, I wanted to start with this image. It's a lot of people don't know or maybe miss, might miss this uh, intervention. And it's basically a wrap on the gallery window. And it's a, it's a kind of a mashup uh, it, the image is actually a mashup of um, this, these street memorials uh, that I sort of researched, um, you know, sort of everyday street memorials that I was taking pictures of um, that inspired the work and the service of the copper um, panels. So the reason I wanted to have that there was it was really about trying to um, talk about or engage that sidewalk space. Because um, literally the work starts there, right? Uh, it really is about that space, that that public space, um, and so that uh, this piece kind of was really important for me to to sort of conjure for the viewer entering uh, before they enter the, the gallery. Yeah, it's it is easy to miss if you're actually approaching the gallery from the other side. You wouldn't even see this. Yeah, it, it really is subtle, um, and and I kind of wanted to visually turn up turn it up a little bit by that yellow wall. Um, I kind of call it the, you know, the, the sort of stoplight yellow, um, but it, it's kind of this, this, this light, another kind of light that I wanted to have. And you're, you're correct, depending on the day, you could easily, <laughs> easily miss it. Yeah, I love that you're actually, you know, conjuring up this idea of the stoplight yellow. I mean, it, it kind of um, matches what, what's on view, like right inside the first thing you see the Harlem driving school. And, you know, it's, it's a lot about like, directing movement through the space, uh, as we'll see. Can we go to inside? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think what, what it, um, I was really trying to think about uh, with, the, with the wrap, the sidewalk, and that, that kind of um, threshold space before you get into the gallery. And then when you get into the gallery, I 
I wanted to uh, engage a viewer in a, a, a kind of a experience that they could be literally inside of. Um, and it was really about trying to think about this space of flux, the space of the sidewalk, the space of the street as a kind of index for them to, um, to have uh, another kind of uh, experience and conversation. And then there is a kind of a, I guess, a guide in this. And it's this guy who, you know, he's the a driving instructor and he's kind of leading. You. So when you enter the space, you're only hearing the driving instructor giving very sincere and rudimentary, um, not actually not so rudimentary, sort of truisms about how to be a good citizen, how to be a good driver. And, and then uh, you're sort of looking at these candles, these prayer candles, these memorial candles that I, um, that I, I sort of brought from the street. And then uh, the, the candles are there on the poles, but the very bottom uh, is actually traffic cones, right, Neri? That are wrapped up. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, doesn't mean. Yeah. So the the cones actually started the entire work. <laughs> it, it, I'll just back up to say how this evolved, because uh, there were two different kinds of works going on in the studio at the time. There's me collecting these prayer memorial candles, prayer mandal candles, and using them in the, uh, the 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 works. We'll show. I'll show you later um, as kind of an engine or a kind of a. Uh, I guess uh, for me, they were a kind of guide for for the, the the making of that work, and then and then there's me wrapping these uh, sort of found cones or cones that were taken from the, the sidewalk, taken from the street, taken from the city, and then covering them with um, with the, the tire threads. And so what I was really thinking about in a very basic way was this another kind of claiming of space that happens with, with the cones, right? That's what they're meant to do. That's what their um, their function is. But I also wanted to have them, and they're sort of assigned this uh, station of stasis. But I really wanted to to kind of confuse that with this element of um, or expectation of movement. So the tire thread became uh, the coating, the covering for them, right? And so there's a kind of anticipation of them operating in a different way than a normal cone would. Um, so I like this this kind of merging of these two kinds of expectation: one of stillness and one of potential for movement and traction, right? That happens with, uh, with the cones. And then um, the, the same time I was thinking, you know, I'm, I wasn't sure how they would live. I knew they, I knew I wanted them to direct the viewer. And so the, the totems, uh, the vertical elements sort of became the, the, the frame for them to present the candles uh, that I was using to, uh, to mark the copper panels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Neri, I think I love that idea of, you know, both stillness and movement. I think if, you know, if you're the person who's putting a cone in a place, you're the one claiming that place. But if you're a person who's approaching a cone, you know that somebody has claimed it and therefore you yourself will then have to move around it. Uh, so that's where it kind of meets, I think. It's, it depends on the perspective of who's doing what. Yeah, and, and exactly. And, and there's this element, I guess I'm always navigating this space of like order, and and how to push back from that order like and i think juan is also one is the order right he's he's kind of like this this kind of safe guide he's trying to keep you safe he's trying to tell you these things that are gonna um allow you to be to to, to navigate uh the space navigate the road but at the same time he's he's, he's directing you we're never sure where we're going because the the image of the the place that he's guiding us through keeps getting obliterated. So we should probably, if we can just start the video a little bit, that would be great. So as you're hearing, as you're walking through the cones and you, you'll kind of hear Juan, the, the driving instructor talking about what, um, what you should do to be a good driver. My name is Juan, I'm going to be your driving instructor. Now, when you're driving, you have to have a big picture. You have to look all the way far and away. You see over there? You have to look at the end of the road. Let's go. So, you see that I'm helping you out? Keep on going straight. Look, no, no, look straight, far and away. 
you look the train, you're going to keep the car straight. If you look sideways, the car's going to go sideways. Because when you're driving, you only use your eyes. Now, when you're driving, keep all... So, he, so that was really important that, you know, he's giving you this really important information, this critical information. But then as you're looking at the view, or as, as you're a viewer or even the driver, uh, there's no space to enter. You're sort of, it's, uh, your vision is being obliterated. And I guess that's what, I, that, that's the, for me, that's the umbrella of the whole exhibition is that we organize systems for trying to navigate um, life, but then there's this big sort of sublime question of death, right? Like nobody kind of knows where, what, how to handle that. We know we're all gonna transition to that, but there's no, uh, it's a big mystery, right? And, and I, I felt like there's a real power in that, but there's also, um, I feel like it's also a kind of space of hope in a, in a strange way as well. Yeah, there's there's something too that I think is really interesting about this uh, part of the exhibitionary is that when you know when I first walked in, I went through and kind of uh, weaved my way around, going zigzagging through it, and then kind of and then watching that video, and then there's that other view. If you go upstairs and you see it from above, if we can show the aerial shot, it's kind you have these two perspectives: one of being in it, kind of like in a sense that you're talking about, you know, navigating through life. And then only it's when you're, you go upstairs to see the overall, then you kind of take that wider view. And so I know Neri, that it was important to you to think of like this aerial view. Can you talk a little bit more about these two different perspectives of the work? I, I think I was really thinking, um, I was trying to consider what that experience would be like for the viewer. And I knew that the gallery had this vista, this top view for both exhibitions, for both uh, installations. And I, and I think it was, for me, it was really about um, the image. You know, I, I, you know, I, I think you might know, Jasmine, I kind of came from the background of being a, a renderer, a drawer. And I, I still, and I always say, I still think about drawing when I, even when I'm doing these, this work, you know, this sculptural work. And I, and I for, so for me, this was thinking of it as an image and what kind of image I wanted it, the experience to be. Uh, so there's that aspect, this sort of, um, outside landscape dialogue with it, and then the inside specific uh, intimacy of looking at candles and looking at the scorched um, wood um, and looking at the gesture that's on the candles from being used in a process. So I, I think both of those moments were really important. Um, I didn't just want it to be one particular moment. And so that's why the top view is really I, I, well considered, um, you know, even before I started the project. Yeah, definitely. I mean, yeah, now that you say that, Mary, like the lines become really crystal clear here of um, the cones forming lines and also the totem lines vertically with the candles on it. Um, and I think this is kind of, you know, like it's always an artist knows, you know, a lot of artists know that thing of um, not knowing where you're going, right? That's, and that's kind of a norm. Like if you're building to work, it's, so you're, trying, you're trying to listen to it. And it wasn't till, you know, quite after almost all the cones were wrapped. <laughs> so this is the thing, right? I, I sort of had the cones and I, I got uh, help working on wrapping these cones. And then my assistants would ask me, what are we gonna do with them? And I, and I actually didn't know what we we're gonna do with them. I just knew that that was the, the, that was the space that whatever uh, the, the candles were gonna do, they had to in, interact with this moment of claiming space, uh, stillness, and, um, and, anticipa and an anticipation of movement. I wanted to assign that to the candle. So then it was really about that line holding the, the, the actual memorial candles. And then it was more about like, what, what is that pattern, right? Because I think pattern is, whether it's a pattern that's on the, the you know, sort of by default, the pattern of the, 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 the tire threads, or the pattern of the the the, um, the actual candles, I feel uh, they have a rhythm, an emotional rhythm, and a psychological rhythm that I had to find, and I think was 
you know, that had to happen while I was doing the work. Mm -hmm. And, and the candles, uh, are very directly connected when you go into the next room as well. Uh, can we go there, Nick? So that was the part that was also really important, right? Uh, just a minute, it's like trying to figure out, I, I'm, I was also trying to be the good guide. You know, I was trying to be like a good one, you know, being sincere, being honest. Um, and I think what I was trying to, you know, what I was thinking about was having the candles present, right? And, and at the same, because I, when I was working on these panel pieces, this, the, the large works and the smaller works, the piece walks, and the rest in pieces, I didn't just want the candles to go away, right? They were really crucial for, um, for driving what that work needed to be for me and in terms of what I wanted from it. And I just, I didn't feel like, it, you know, now they were just, you know, art material that was gonna be sort of, you know, sort of put aside. I really wanted them to be in, in the installation and become part of the experience. And so that, uh, that was really crucial that, I found a form for them to live and make sense. And then they would lead you to the peace walk, which are the bigger um, pieces on the bigger sidewalk uh, representations that you're, we're now looking at on the left. Mm -hmm. The candles definitely are the continuity. And I mean, it just, um, there are many pieces of this exhibition and you know, there's later on, we'll see the shoelace pieces um, that, that actually, you know, reads out that I'll take you there, which is, you know, the name of the exhibition, but you talking about wanting to be a good guide and, you know, Juan being a guide through the first part of it, even the title, I'll take you there, you know, yes, it references that song, but it's also really about movement or doing something together, moving somewhere together, um, somebody guiding someone else. Yeah, and all the titles of the Peace Walk works are all about uh, a kind of um, coming together, right, the, mm -hmm. the assembly, um, you know, this congregation, like all of this is about coming together. So that was what was really crucial for me in my reflecting on what I thought was, I, I kind of said sort of throughout the idea that death is mysterious, but also hopeful. And, and I guess what I was, I was sort of explained that a little bit more is that I was thinking about how coming together in the face of this unknown is, is kind of puts you in a state of dismissing all the other stuff, right? All the other stuff goes away. This, you know, I, I always feel like it's that, that moment where that you, you kind of understand your humanity, right? And, I, and, I, and so I, I, I almost feel like that in some ways when people come together, whether it's a funeral home, whether it's a memorial on the street, there, there is a kind of honoring of a shared humanity that, um, that, that, that's an equalizer. And that, that's what I meant by that kind of hopeful, uh, aspect of relating to death. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you can definitely see that here in this particular room and the different aspects of it. Uh, Nair, maybe you can, I think there are details here that we can show of the actual stuff that you're using in the still life with ladders in the middle. Um, can you talk about the process and the materials you actually used? I know you gather these when you're walking on the streets and look, finding street memorials. Are you actually yeah. here? I actually have a question for you, Neri. When you're walking, sure. are you just, um, do you have a predetermined route or are you uh, by chance just walking around or? Um... Yeah, no, just just walking around. I think there are certain, and, 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 and sometimes driving, I'll just pull over. I see, I'll see when I'll drive and I'll pull over and jump out. And, you know, and so, so what I was looking for when I was, I've been out to take a picture, right? And so what I was really looking for were the things that were consistent from each one, right? Depending on any, regardless of neighborhood, the candles were consistent, um, alcohol was consistent, some kind of text, you know, with, you know, some, some um, note uh, to the individual was consistent. Um, and, and I think that was, and then also trying to organize the memorial, like everybody had a different way to organize it, right? And so, um, okay, so the, these, what we're jumping, from another piece, maybe I don't want to confuse the viewers. So this is still live the stepladder, um, which is shown the cosmogram, this Congolese cosmogram. We should probably stick to the, we'll, we'll get to this later, but we should probably just for now, stick to the, the um, peace walk um, and the rest in pieces, the copper pieces. Uh, although this, the, the, the still live the stepladder is really important. So a little bit earlier, it's like a year 
earlier this work, but it, it was the anchor for both for the Harlem Driving School and these copper pieces. Um, but I just want to just go into how, like you said, Jasmine, how, uh, how it's made. Mm -hmm. how I think there, there, we have, a, I think, at least one studio shot, right? Of the copper, uh, of Neri working on the copper pieces. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is a smaller wrist in piece. Um, so there, there, this is kind of one section of the sidewalk. You see those, that stencil on, on the edge is kind of the pattern of the sidewalk. And so if you'll notice, one thing that's really important is I'm turning the candles upside down when I'm, mar when I'm making the mark. And I, and I kind of felt like um, it was about that energy of that light, that light that was lit for that individual uh, or that memory. And, um, and they became the sort of way to make that mark on the copper, because then I applied it, the, the, uh, the varying kinds of patina acids um, for it to, uh, to mark the copper. And then I'd come back in and, and create um, striations of light on the surface of the copper to sort of bring the light. I guess I, what I was thinking is bringing the, the emanation more than the, the candlelight, emanation of light back into um, the storytelling of the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. Can we get, uh, there we go. So, so this is another, this, so these are Peace Walk um, works and they're larger and there's, there are larger sections of the sidewalk. And I, and I was really um, happy with this fact that these, these Peace uh, Walk uh, pattern, the sidewalk pattern still had just by chance the cross in them, right? Like that's just the nature of the, that pattern. And, and if you look at it, you can see there's a cross, you can see there's maybe stretchers of a, maybe like a, a, a painting. That, that kind of ambiguity was really um, important and specificity, because it was definitely about trying to capture the sidewalk. And, I, and, and so in laying the, the, uh, the bottles and, and, and candles then, I, I would try to really think of their relationship to that cross, to that middle design. Um, because that crosswalk was really the, the, the kind of framework for guiding the composition on the, on the piece walk pieces. And then there would be just this, again, this sort of dragging the lines back in, um, striating the lines. And the nails were also about bringing light back into uh, that trace of the bottles and cans. I love the kind of also, again, that change in perspective that what's inspiring this is the surface that you're walking on, this kind of like very horizontality and then presenting it in a space in this vertical way makes it um, maybe confrontational is like a very strong word, but the fact that yes, in a way it is, it's like we have to confront the very thing that we're doing, which is walking and what's happening there, the memorials that you're encountering in it. Yeah, I think that, um... I was thinking of that in terms of even the installation, right? I, I really wanted an installation that you, you walk into, which is driving school, Harlem driving school, and the installation that you have to see as an image as well, which is uh, while, you're, while you're on the same level with it, this kind of landscape, which is still lies as step ladders. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, I was thinking about these, it's like you're aware of your um, disconnection in a, in a strange way, because you're I'm, I'm, and I'm also walking on these because you're when you look at these details, there are some footprints where I I'm walking with two two particular shoes. I only wore I only wore Timberlands and Air Jordans when I was walking on these. That and it was kind of a, a, a kind of a nod and nod and a wink back to the breathing panel works, where I was talking about landscape and using like street vernacular uh, st footwear to talk about the landscape, like the land and air. So um, it, I, oh, I brought that back, that language back into the Peace Walk uh, works as well. Mm -hmm. So these, uh, because I no longer had the cross pattern in the smaller works, I was excited to bring back the cosmogram because the cosmogram is inherently, has that the diagram, uh, the, the, the uh, copper, rather the, the, um, the middle pattern symbol has that cross in it, the, the diamond. Mm -hmm. And it does tie back into this idea of death and also rebirth and hope, right? Yes, yes. So they, the cosmogram is, you know, the Congolese cosmogram, uh, the sort of symbolism behind it is definitely this notion of uh, life, um, birth, 
death and rebirth. Um, and it's and, and it's basically like like the cross is it's a designation of sunrise and sunset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In these, sure. it, it's almost entirely it's it's actually it's entirely the 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 um, the prayer candles are used, as opposed to the peace walk works. There are um, bottles, a lot of bottles, um, alcohol bottles are used in those, and and a combination. Mm -hmm. So, sorry, I cut you off. Uh, you no, so. um, I was just going to ask, you know, for, for folks who are not as familiar with the Congolese cosmogram and how this has appeared uh, or has been significant in your other work as well, and how you came across it in Georgia, can you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Yes. Yeah, so I was um, doing a site visit, doing a project, a video actually, um, in uh, Savannah, Georgia, and, and the curator brought me to this church that was built by enslaved uh, people and it was uh they, they, there's um belief that it was a site of the underground railroad and that the the holes that were made on the ground floor of this church um they were made into this pattern they were they were made into these this kind of like ventilation uh holes um they were like made 26 sets on the on the um the first floor and so there's a, sort of a, I, then they'll be sure, but they think that they were breathing holes for individuals that would hide underneath. Uh, it was a sighted underground railroad, so they uh, hide underneath in the in the daytime and in the night, uh, escape north. So I, I really wanted to figure out how to use this this American history story, and and bring it to a kind of a, a contemporary dialogue. So that's how the idea of walking on top of the the panels or sort of reinscribing the story in this copper material and walking on top of it. Um, brought about the breathing, um, the breathing panel works that I did earlier on, where it would it was much more that, in fact, the nails were were used to sort of echo the the sort of void of those of those holes um, in that series, and in, in, in this series the nails are used to echo the, the light in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. Neri, can you actually also talk about uh, the material itself, copper? I know you've uh, talked about that before as the significance of copper. Yeah, I, of I kind of, you know, I guess I'm always thinking about, you know, um, what these things, what their potential might be, um, what their beliefs, what belief systems are linked to them. And I think copper is a, is a kind of a material for me, and I think it's, it's, it's a material that's doesn't break down, right? It's it's a sort of symbol of resilience in a way, um, and it's actually used mostly now, mostly in the in the industrial sort of roofing industry for that reason. Uh, a lot of the copper panels, that's where I got got the source sourced them from. And then the other thing is, a lot of cultures, it's used for healing. There's a there's a kind of a, a notion that it, uh, it it can heal the body, and I, and I, I got really excited about both of those uh, components being brought back into the conversation with this narrative, this historic narrative. And, and, I, and so my, my thing is, what I was also really excited about is the ability to, to sort of make marks on it as a kind of drawing, but also the fact that by scratching into it, you could also like etching, you could also bring back light, you know, and mm -hmm. Um, and that became the, 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 actually when I was working on the breathing panels, that was the last aspect that came into it because, you know, just, just trying to put more light back in around that, those dark holes and just kind of scratching the, the surface. If you, if you ever get a chance to see the early breathing panels, they're literally lines that you've done at hands with at the rulers. So they're, they're, they're quite crude, but they, they get that narrative across. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing, you know, yes, your your use of the candles to make this work. The other thing that connects this with uh, the other work that's in this room, the still life with step ladders, is um, just the idea of like what's hidden in plain sight. You know, like with the co cosmogram and like the history that you've brought up of the um, being a stop on the underground railroad and 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 folks being underneath, like the surface that others are walking on, just being hidden in plain sight. Whereas here in the still life with step ladders, you've covered everything up with like this landscape uh, material. Yeah, th that's a really good point. And and that th this work was so um, important. Um, it's the anchor for the the journey in a way. And I really wanted to to show it. And and 
this kind of came about, it sort of came about during COVID, during, during our, we're still in COVID, but early stages of COVID, uh, where everything was shut down. And um, so what, what happened was I would go outside and, you know, and walking around in the morning times, I would see all these bottles, alcohol bottles um, from people having congregated in the nighttime, um, you know, on the sidewalk. And then by the midday, they would be gone. Somebody cleaned them up. But I really felt like there was a story that I wanted to, to uh, talk about and tell uh, with using these bottles. And so I started just collecting them. And, you know, for a brief time, I was kind of like the bottle guy in the neighborhood, you know, and, and, and then I realized I needed, you know, so on one corner, there, there may be from 20 to 40 bottles, right? And, and so that, 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 that um, scaling up was, a, I know I needed just to do more. So I just kept collecting more. And then when the, when the bars opened, I started going to the bars before they closed to get the bottles. Um, so in, in the in still as a step ladder, which is what this um, you're showing here, the the pattern that I created was the is the con Congolese cosmogram. I didn't really want you said it. I didn't really want it to be so um, dire. This the the symbol of hope was, which is what this represented, was important for me. So I started sort of bringing them back in with the um, with this patterning in, in, the, in the installation itself. Mm -hmm. Can you talk, so what exactly is this fabric that you're, or like this, this tarp that you've used to cover everything? So, so it is, it is basically, I'm, I'm creating a landscape because it is landscape uh, fabric. It's used, it's used in, in landscape industry to kind of separate, uh, to control the growth, right? So it's, it, um, it separates like good soil, the more nutritious soil, from the less desirable soil, so that doesn't have as much nutrients. And so you lay this down and then put the really good soil on top and, and do your planting in that way. Uh, so it allows for the water to still go through and you know, irrigation to happen. But you, it's totally about this element of control. And I was really fascinated that um, with this notion of control being brought into the conversation of this uh, landscape, but also that I could, when I, when I kind of heated it up, it, it covered, it almost coated, um, did not just wrapped, literally sort of shrunk onto the whatever, whatever form I, I was um, working with. And, I, and I, I, that transformation and, and that kind of, uh, I guess, expectation for it was really interesting. Like how, how the surface shifted and how now it became uh, part of a different kind of uh, world, uh, world expectation for it. Mm -hmm. And mystery, right? Because you're not sure, you know, they're glass bottles, but you're not sure what, in, in, you know, what their purpose might be. Right. I mean, there are, many of them are glass bottles, but even interspersed with kind of the, these little episodes of a designed cosmogram or, or another kind of grouped, um, grouped uh, aspect of it, there are also the candles. So there's bottles and candles yeah. and they're all like made of glass. And so that makes me think of glass as being a transparent, you know, material. You can see through it. Yet now you've you've covered it up. And so there's there's that kind of layering there too. And um, there's also the the sense of glass as a kind of transparent, like you said, also but also reflect, you know, like light hitting, mm -hmm. and, and against this dark this darkness, right? And I, and, I, and I also wanted that to come come across. But even the material is not. It, it is dark, but it also cast its own light like there is because it's a woven fabric it mm -hmm. it doesn't just mat out it's not just a matte black it it kind of yeah you can see it kind of catches its own kind of glistening of light mm -hmm. and you can you can get a sense of what it is covering you can tell you know okay oh this this is a this, stone <laughs> yeah yeah this this is a candle i could see jesus through it or something <laughs> or i i can kind of make out the brand of vodka that this is or uh you get a you get a glimpse you certainly get a glimpse I, I think, think we'll, it's a bit of strategy of mine in the installations that I've done is trying to have that thing that's recognizable, but, but hidden so that there is um, um, a kind of imagination of completion that has to happen, that you kind of have to figure out what, you know, how it belongs now in this new uh, use or what might be hidden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it takes time. You don't just walk around this thing and figure it out and go. It, it takes, a, yeah, it takes time.
So there are other things that I also wanted to bring in because just, you know, like, like the, um, the language that I was trying to develop my personal language with the, with the uh, shoe prints, the Air Jordans and, and um, Timberlands, I kind of decided to bring in certain elements that I've done in other works. Like there's a baby stroller. Mm -hmm. There is a, a, a kind of a suitcase. Mm -hmm. And, and, there, and, and it's, it was more like me talking to other works. You know, the baby stroller, of course, Amazing Grace, the, shoot, the suitcase is more like um, Exodus, this earlier work that I did these, these um, sort of packages wrapped in fire hose. So I was really also having a conversation with myself, um, my practice in, in the work as well. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit about the, the title of this installation, Still Lives with Stepladders? I mean, the stepladders are very evident there, but even kind of a conversation with the genre of still life. I think I was trying, you know, still life in the, in the gallery setting, right? The gallery setting is very known, right? The still life is, is, a, is a genre, a historic genre in, in painting and 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 photography and i think um i wanted to take that into sculpture and i think that that was one thing but i was also within the title it was also talking about um in, in, a, in a social political context context it was talking about i guess stagnation you know a, a certain group of individuals who aren't allowed to to um to have financial uh, mobility. Um, so that's why the stepladders there, and, and even the term still lives, right? Like, um, and, and the stepladders don't have rungs, they're all cemented up. So there's, the, there's a kind of a backdrop of that within the work. Um, and I think I was trying to, for me, the, 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 the hopeful part that which I'm always searching for is, is the light dialogue. That's also part of the, the still life of step ladders and the light dialogue that's a part of any depiction in the still life um, composition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even just looking at this particular image, uh, taking it all in with the, the copper panels, the peace walks and uh, this installation taken together, the light definitely comes through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that was the, the the very top of the the ladders are a kind of conventional uh, still life, and I, and I and I think I was looking at finding a way to even um, bring the idea of the the studio or a, a kind of art narrative in, into the the dialogue. So you know, my conversation with Mirandi, my mm -hmm. you know talking about Mirandi in relationship to the work. I got really intrigued with how he would use repetition in his representation of his still lives, and also mon sort of almost monochromatic, a certain certain era of Mirandi's practice, monochromatic discourse. You get a sense that he was not just trying to, he wasn't really just thinking about depiction, but he's also trying to think about a kind of mystery and a kind of search um, and trying to take a viewer in, along with that as well. So I, I think that's what, um, for me, the this the, the connection to a kind of more art historical uh, framework was definitely connected to him. Yeah, Mirandi, and I, uh, I'm thinking of his works that are, you know, kind of gray in palette, you know, very kind of, uh, and thinking about even grayness as, as a concept as being an in-between. And so uh, I think this is really interesting. It's like taking, you know, I know that you've uh, spoken in the past about how this, or, um, about how your work and especially this exhibition is kind of you know connecting the street to the gallery or the street to the museum um and even just like the the wrapping that where we began like come uh, from outside being uh, visible from outside is is that in between space um yeah that's what and, that makes me it, think of and that within that in between space is it's always difficult because once you name it then it's no longer an in between space right like that's the so that i, I think that's why i'm always trying to uh, conceal things like things are there, but they're never always there. They're never always mm -hmm. there's traces of things, uh, and I'm more ex excited about embellishing the traces than the actual thing itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but the, the the thing that's also really you know I'm a hawk for 
titles, uh, uh, just a minute. And, and the, the one thing I do want to say that I was really, um, you know, sometimes I, I won't let a work finish in my head until I find a title that resonates. And the, the Peace Walk, the, the way they came about is that I'd always see, you know, in every one, every almost 90% of the memorials, if anything was written, it would be rest in peace, right? And, and several versions of that, you know, rest in power, um, rest easy. And so I, I really wanted to do this, again, this kind of mashup between the, the sidewalk and the, this idea of peace walk, the peace that's so prevalent in the memorials. So the peace walk um, coming together, the, the, the sort of naming uh, um, peace walk really came uh, as a result of that. And then when I, you know, I, my in my research, I was realizing that peace walk is also something that's done in protest, right? So I, I, so I, I like that that um, that element is also in the work, but it wasn't where I started. <laughs> it wasn't where I started. I ended up there um, through through these um, different associations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So walking through the space first, it's the Harlem Driving School, and then you go through here, and then uh, the third kind of bigger big component of the show is going downstairs to see the shoelace pieces. Oh yeah. Should we, right. should we yeah. go there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, you know, I wish, I wish th this is like the, I always kind of feel like this, the shoelace piece is the soundtrack for the upstairs, right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. <laughs> they're really, they're really like trying to use these um, album covers mostly, at least two of them, um, that somehow, you know, are about resistance or protest. And even more importantly for me, it was, wasn't just that, is that these were, songs that became part of the mainstream people almost didn't even know that what's going on you know you you know Marvin Gaye sung that song and they, if people listen to it now they don't know that what that what it's referencing right mm -hmm. it, was, it was it was a protest song again about Vietnam mm -hmm. another thing that's really interesting intriguing for me in language right is that it that never really had a question after a question mark after say what's going on it was mm -hmm. always, and so I always felt like that phrase was more an, in using that phrase, it was an acknowledgement of being present, right? It was like acknowledgement of like, we're here together. So it's, like, it's like a together acknowledgement. Um, and I, so, so I always felt like without that question mark in the piece, in the, in the resonance of presenting that language, it was always more about being together. You know, so I, so I, and and in the other, you know, you know, I'll, I'll take you there. Staple singer song. There's a really important line within the song where I think it goes. I'm not bad at. <laughs> I won't sing it, but it's <laughs> so, something to the effect of you know, um, turning your back on, um, like the the the, the 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 phony smiles or something like that. There's a, so, within the so, song itself, and I I just thought that. Um, that made so much sense now, you know, like taking you to a place of hope and dismissing all the negativity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And again, it's, it's, it's a togetherness. I'll take you there. It's not, you know, walking right. alone. It's right. walking with someone. Yeah. And, these, and, and so this is a um, talking about trying to find a title for this show. Um, I, I really debated and struggled over these two uh, phrase, you know, um, I'll take you there and a proclamation. I couldn't, because both of them really, from me, f um, made sense for the work. And so that's why I just kind of like put them together. So I was like, okay, that, that, that I'm not going to let one go and take the other, just one. I can have both of them. Mm -hmm. So the, a, a proclamation is like a public decree. And, and I felt like, you know, these, um, these memorials are a kind of public offering. And, um, and then, of course, like, like the Harlem Driving School, this journey of taking somebody somewhere, I'll take you there was so important. So they're both, you know, for me, they're, they're both parts of the installations upstairs that, that I decided to just tie them together um, in, in, the, in the naming of the, of the show. Mm -hmm. Well, even the phrase, I'll take you there, is also, in a sense, a proclamation. It's, I'm proclaiming that I'm, right. I'm going to take you somewhere. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
what it's about really great to see them together you know that's mm -hmm. my excite the exciting part of the you know having thought about them seeing them in the studio but then having to see them in the same space was really uh crucial and and then um you know that that as an as a kind of you know environment was uh key mm -hmm. so the the last shoelace piece um is kind of if we must die piece is, is some is a piece that I, I always wanted to use and I had to find the right um, tenor for it. So it's a Claude McKay poem and it's written in 1919, you know, like, so this is before Marcus Garvey's, you know, um, Black Power or um, sort of, a, you know, a movement for going back to Africa and sort of Black, Black, uh, Basically, Marcus Garvey is the sort of founder of, of the Black Lives Matter movement in a way, because that's that he he sort of took it upon himself to say, this is important. We are important uh, being here. Although his one thing was he wanted to take us back to Africa, right? That was the, the one um, discrepancy. But so Claude McKay, within within that era, prior to even that, you know, there was so much, I guess, fear, uh, terrorism. Uh, white terrorism that was proliferated, white supremacy terrorism that was proliferated in the culture, unchecked. You know, uh, you know, you're, this, I'm talking about a time when lynching was a norm, where they were making postcards and sending it around. And you know, so so this is where he, this poem was written in in the light of that, we're talking about resistance by any means, even if we must die. And I thought that was such a, a powerful um, statement on the heels of the Black Lives Matter movement that I really wanted to include it with the conversation of the other pieces. Yeah, this, I mean, going going back to 1919 and then going back to uh, the Marvin Gaye and the Staples Sisters song, uh, Civil Rights Area, you're, you're reaching really across through the 20th century and then using kind of the shoelaces or, you know, vernacular material, I guess you could say. Yeah. Um, and so this makes me think of a phrase I've, I've heard you say before, too, about, you know, bringing a historical dialogue with like a corner store dialogue and really um, connecting the two. Which is yeah, really you know, I, I always call myself a, a social realist uh, sculptor, you know, <laughs> in that I, I always really want the thing to be recognizable and, and start with a particular experience. Like, I don't, I, you know, I have nothing against abstraction. And I, there's a lot of abstract moments within the installations upstairs, but I did want to tell a very particular story or at least have somebody enter through a particular framework in acknowledging a story and then have it open up. So I, I kind of feel like an ob the object that's recognizable is something I want to start with. And then, then the challenge is how to abstract it, how to, mm -hmm. how to fracture it to become uh, sort of spaces for other experiences to happen. Mm -hmm. and I think that's that's achieved. Thanks uh, uh, for this detail. Actually, is when we, you see the details of these works, you're getting really up close, and then again, you see, you know, you can talk about it in formal terms, the right. line and the drawing and the color and that kind of thing. Um, yeah. The one really key thing, Jessamy, that I always push, and you know, uh, I always felt like, you know, these are meant to be wall drawings like they when I do the maquette in a foam you know that's kind of like the how I work on it but then the culmination and the the, the finish for me is get seeing it as part of the architecture you know mm -hmm. seeing it in the actual space um, I think it's a kind of um, that humble material being relegated to it's labor. I mean, it's a lot of work to do it because each hole, you know, each yeah. lathe has to be uh, sort of put into that hole, and the holes have to be drilled. And so it's a commitment to have this uh, this work. And I, I kind of felt that was an important part, you know, um, a la Salouet, you know, part of the mm -hmm. wall, wall drawing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, well, terrific. Um, I think we have a few minutes left before Q and A. Neri, do you have any kind of um, reflections about the entire show overall now that we've gone through all the spaces you know i i think the thing that i get i'm excited more i, I i'm almost i say this a lot i almost don't want to talk about the works i'm excited to hear other people's ex experience with it 
Um, so I, I kind of feel like what I would love to have people think about is, yeah, a little bit of how the work was made, but that's not the work. Mm -hmm. Right. Like, I, and I think that's what I, that's the hard thing to, to, to ask for, but I think it's what I would want for the viewer, right. To, to not say, oh, so this is what this is about. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't really always know what it's about, you know, and that's mm -hmm. kind of the idea. I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out how to, to make the thing build another set of moments experientially. So I, I kind of would, you know, so that's why it's the excitement with, is more talking to people about what their reaction is to it or what it might trigger for them and their memory or their experience then to sort of expound on why I made it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So it's a par small part of why it's important, but I, I don't think it's the work, you know, it's kind of the, the framework for what I would want them to sort of forget about and, and think about it in a different way. Mm -hmm. On that note of wanting to hear people's reactions, maybe we can open it up uh, to the Great. larger group. Of course. Um, well, thank you so much, Neri and Jessamine, for this wonderful conversation. Um, we do have some questions from the audience, so we'll jump right into that. Uh, first, we'll pass it over to our friend GE Schwartz. Uh, GE, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Thank you so much, and thank you. Um, I'm I'm so fascinated by the fact that you seem to be as um, you know inspired in your creation by by Joseph Boys as much as Claude McKay, and and that was my original thing of like how are they inspiring to you? Of course, we talked a little bit about McKay, but I guess I'm also fascinated too because both of these people, um, if in fact Boys figures into your process, were both actually not American, but others who came from other places and created this wonderful otherness. And I was wondering if that means anything to you or if you could speak on that a bit, thank you. Oh, great, thanks for that question. I, I do feel a, a connection to, to Boyce, um, this kind of animism of material expectation, I think is really exciting. And I, and I also have to acknowledge that Boyce, you know, in, in a lot of, when I look at you and you see a, a Joseph Boyce work, now a lot of it is coming from performative discourse, right? It, it, you're seeing the residue of something he's done. He's, he's, he, he never really, he didn't really prioritize aestheticizing it as the, the, the pivotal thing, the main thing. And so I, I'm, it, that's, uh, that's kind of intriguing to think about because I always think about when I'm making even my work, I'm always thinking about its use you know, a sculpture, I'm, I'm trying to think at, I'm trying to put a component of, of use to it, even if even it's an imagined use. So that, that, that is in, intriguing. But I, I think the bigger thing that you're getting at is this idea, the idea that, um, I think it might be like, maybe Stuart Hall talks about this, this thing about the hybridity, right? This notion of creolization. And, and I always felt that that was, there was something inherently problematic in that because there's this thing, there's this expectation or presumption that there is a kind of pure or a kind of um, uh, basic uh, existence or of humanity. And I, I always felt like everything was uh, mixing. We're all coming together. You know, everything is evolving um, and becoming. And, and, I, and I think we might mark a moment as being like, everything is coming from this moment, but that, there's other moments before before that, uh, so this idea of otherness is is even it's in itself <laughs> problematic, uh, you know, because the, you're assuming that that that's there's a central vision, and there is there is I'm not saying there isn't, but I I think one of our one of the things that I like to to do is think beyond that, right? That 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 it that um, that so-called marginal space, it might be the interesting. Thing to center or figuring out what that whatever that centering might mean right and and as a result of centering that marginal so-called marginal space what else what what else kind of um dialogues can can happen i think that you know i i think that's one of the things i always try to talk to my students about is um that's why you know black studies is really interesting for for that reason for artists in general because it, it is that we've been Blackness has been relegated to the margins, um, and and I and I think that that's a space 
that you see it now that's being mined uh, and reflected and black culture continually being mined in the mainstream and, and I think it's important to kind of really think about what things are being taken from it or extracted as well as what things are inherent to that space um, I don't know it, it, I mean it's a lot that you brought in uh, so I'm not sure if I answered it but that that notion of of, of otherness maybe its own fiction i guess that's what i'm getting at right and i i was also thinking it turns out also both you and claude mckay came from other places to here to this experience and therefore you're wonderfully transforming it and taking it on you know yeah claude mckay you're, you're right he's a fellow jamaican Jamaican, yes <laughs> so it's also that right. component of the of the of him of using his uh his poem that was really uh important for me i don't you know i don't know what um, what to say about that in that it, when the song, when the, when the poem was written, it was celebrated by, you know, a lot of the scholars of the day, but it wasn't really, I think they, they realized that it was important, but there was no place to take it, right? Like there's no, there wasn't any, uh, it wasn't going to be heralded in, in, um, in, in, in the literary, cir literary circles, it was, but not necessarily uh, to bring it um, to the mainstream. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, thanks for asking the question. Thank you, GE. And um, thank you, of course, Neri, for that response. Um, Nicole, I see that you have raised your hand, so I'm going to pass you the mic next. Uh, you should be able to turn your mic on now. Hey, Nicole. Hey, hi. Hey, so I'm um, really thinking about the Peace Walk works and um, the, there is you know, very much materiality there, but there's also the absence of it. And as a viewer, I am levitating as well. And to me, that takes me to this really discussion around not just ritual, but very much in African cultures, the liminal transitional space. Um, can you address that a little bit more? I mean, I, I, I feel like there is that always an active awareness of that with you. Can you speak about that in these works a little bit more? I, I kind of feel like I don't know, uh, and I'm not being humble. I, I, don't nev I never know how to do it. Like, <laughs> I, I kind of, no, because I set up, I think my way of dealing with this, and, and maybe it's, I don't even know if it's answering your question, is, is bringing the physical, the very physical volume, volume up the physical, the, the like the copper light mark making, uh, scratching it up, uh, space that it occupies, and then try to have this other moment of absence around that. Like like put those two things in opposition, and then find a tension for them um, to be in dialogue. And that tension is what I think is your that levitating dialogue is happening in. It is the tension between those two displaced expectations, you know? And, and I kind of, and I, that's something I do a lot in pro almost all the work. I try to find the total opposite um, moment to have something else happen. Maybe that to sort of find the viewer, so the viewer can sort of, and I feel like the, 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 the broader, the, the, the wider that expanse is, the more and the, and the ability to keep that tension, the more uh, drama, and the more that I guess I'm talking about drama in terms of storytelling, but the more that levitation and drama is for me the same thing. I think it really echoes um, the black experience in the Americas. It's this, it's like this active place of this almost, it's almost not tangible, but it is the experience of 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 it is the black experience in the Americas and not just in the North American space, but I think throughout. Mm. I never thought of that. Mm. Yeah, so, I think it's very, very powerful. Thanks, Nicole. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nicole and Mary. Um, next, I'm going to pass the mic over to Juan Sanchez. Uh, Juan, you should be able to turn your mic on now. Hey, Juan. Hey, hi, hi, Mary. How are you doing? Hey, man. Thanks for checking in. This is great. By all means, I wouldn't miss it in the world. 
it's, it's, it's fascinating um, the way you talk about the work and you point out a certain aspect of what is visible and how you open it up with all these layers of, of references and your thought process that, that really gives a visibility to, to the invisible, so to speak. So, so they're so, they're so uh, multi-layered and um, I'm, I'm, I'm fascinated because I have uh, a tendency of thinking that way. I, I work, I, I, I study what, what I just uh, executed and I let the work unveil. And then that's when I start adding uh, perhaps uh, in the space or, or the gaps uh, that, that, that's there for me. And I wanted, I wanted you to talk a little bit more about that because I think you know, the fact that there's a, there's a moment or there are moments where you don't know what's happening, uh, which happens to me often. And then when you look at that mark or that gesture or, or that element that, that you added to the piece, all of a sudden the answer starts conjuring up right in front of your eyes and then you act on it. Right. And I, I, wonder, I wonder if you could articulate <laughs> That yeah, that's process. hard. <laughs> uh, or, I, think or that's I think you just said it. I think you just said it. But, but yeah, no, I, I think that's the, the, um, so the layers are learned, right? Like they're, they're, they almost think about it as a file, a file cabinet. Like there are these different files in the cabinet. And I, and I feel like that's what I was getting at is like the, um, Mirandi was one more file. Right, like you know, and and so it's like the more files you have, the 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 more you have to then have the visual. Um, if you think of it now, if you think of it as like a, a scale, so you have all these files of expectation. We call them layers, and then you have that this visual manifestation that has to now carry this. And I, I almost see like the visual has to be volumed up for me. This is my strategy. The visual has to be volumed up to warrant holding these files in balance right and i think that's my that's what i'm always trying to do with this through the patterning through the the, the 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 hiding through the 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 um material transformation the firing you know using fire or the chemicals it's like trying to make that that visual component so um so mysterious so sublime that these files that you're putting in these files of expectations uh are in that whether there's tension or balance in discourse, but but somehow in that conversation together, and I feel like tension is the the thing, right? That, that the more tension they have, and tension, I mean, there's a kind of connectedness, uh, an energy of connectedness, but then the viewer is the one that's negotiating that energy of connectedness, right? That, that that's what you, you're offering that for them. Thanks. Thank you, Juan. Thank you. It's great to have you uh, here. Thank, thank you, Juan. Colleague, um, so a, a colleague of mine at Hunter and a much respected uh, artist. Really, really great to have him. Um, thank you so much, um, both Juan and Neri. Um, David, I can see you raising your hand, so I'm going to uh, pass you the mic next. Yeah, I just wanted to say that this point that started with Nicole and that Juan brought up causing Neri to just say that last little bit. To me, that is kind of it in a pretty big way, having to do with physicality and absence and that opposition becomes part of how the work opens up to very different but very specific switches or alternate reads. And that thing that you call tension or I experience it as a kind of psychic charge, that is also part of the purpose. That's what makes the work, it's, it's a necessary confrontation that is necessary to the work actually becoming viable and useful. Mm, right, right. And I experienced that with your, the earlier Breathing Holes piece uh, show, maybe it was around 2011 or something when Lehman Maupin was on the Lower East Side. Right, and they had that space to look down on it. The cosmograms and the piano with the keys and the Breathing Holes. And 
that has still stayed with me in a powerfully immediate way. Oh, great. Thank you. That includes all the things the work is about, but it can't be boiled down to just, you know, a flat statement. It, it's part of what actually makes the work living and viable. It's a real specific thing. I think a lot of people maybe don't even think that much about that, but to me, it's really crucial. And uh, that's why I'm here and I thank you so much. All right, thank you. I agree with mm -hmm. you, thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you so much, David. And, and thanks for tuning in so often. Um, next, I'm gonna pass the mic to the Rails own Fong to ask our final question of the day. Uh, Fong, you should be able to turn your mic on now. Hi, thank you, Nikki. Thank you, Neri. Hey, Fong. Hey, good seeing you, man. Good to see you. You look like a, I don't know, a fancy rap rapper. <laughs> thank you. You see oh. my, my hat, you, you see what that says? No. It says Obia. Oh. You, know, you know, it's not Obey, it's Obia. I it's, see. So Obia, Obia yeah. is the sort of Jamaican practice of, um, of transformation, really, it's, you know, it's like uh, the the Haitians have their own uh, African diasporic sort of magic. Yeah. Obia is a Jamaican magic. Yeah. Right. Well, it's Obia. I think that uh, thank you, Jasmine, for a wonderful conversation with Neri. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think talk about magic and ritual. I think that's something a little bit more invested in in our other friend also a fellow your fellow jamaican um arthur sims one right. of our yeah. oldest friends but so listen my question is very simple i have yet seen the show but i follow you work for a long time Neri. i wanted to uh, ask you the the whole idea about memorial because that's what this show's about and i exactly. remember talking to uh, my late friend Jack Whitten and Jack, you know, have created this body of work. When I curate the show of his, particularly in 2007 at MoMA PS1, it focused on the group of paintings that he pulled out when I first visited him in Queens, the former fireman house, was immediately when I walked in, he said to me, are you Vietnamese? I said, yes, I am indeed. And then he pulled out series of paintings he made during the war in the 60s between the Vietnam War, anti-protest war, and a many beginning of memorial uh, effort to, uh, of course, Martin Luther King, you know, Dr. King, and right. then other friends, including artists that he knew, like Romain Bearden, Norman Lewis. Um, and later, the idea was that we not honor the dead through memory, was, I remember what he said. And it became very luminous in some cases. They never remained the shame, with the, the shame at all, with the Barbara Jordan, for example, to Lena Horn, you know? And right, so, exactly. And, and they are their own constellation. So I wonder, whether you have a rapport or any form of formal or emotional affinity to Jack's own work. Oh yeah, no, definitely. Um, I always felt like Jack, this whole thing we've been talking about with material. So, so I, I got the chance to meet Jack through another artist named Al Loving, who's an amazing artist. Yes. And Al, I'd always go to Al's studio. He didn't kick me out as just knucklehead student. He never kicked me out. He always just opened, just opened the studio for me to hang out there. And a lot of people would come and hang out. But I got fascinated. He was at a stage in his paintings, the different stages, where he was making the, um, the, the surface. He was sort of making the material. Yeah. The, the paint was material, like acknowledgement of the paint. It wasn't just about the paint to depict something. The paint itself had a material um quality that they were interested in and i think jack also had this you know mm -hmm. like he's really thinking about paint as kind of material and literally he would put the paint down and cut it back up and re remake it in the kind of mosaic fashion so i i felt like that that affinity and that connectedness to the material and the material uh, um in storytelling and that mm -hmm. and then it allowed them it allowed them a different kind of position than the history 
that they that painting was um, you know had adopted, and it was an interesting time. A lot, a lot, I think Katie Siegel writes about this. You know the, and I remember Jack talking a little bit about this because I was a student of his as well, and he talked about um, the acrylic, right? Because that was that medium sort of blew up in the in the mainstream about the time that they came into the mix. Uh, their their uh, their vision, Jack you know, all of these artists, it's like that's late 60s, 70s. Acrylic started to come out as a medium to counter, to almost to sort of, they were getting it for free because the manufacturers wanted uh, artists to use it because they people were only using oils. Yeah. That was the, the material of choice. Mm -hmm. So that idea that it was, it was not just a material for depiction, but a material that could be a vehicle of meaning in and of itself as a material became, uh, I think the, the, consistent dialogue that I find um, with him, you know, and he, and he literally would do things like put it down, get traces of things on the, you know, you know, maybe like um, textures, cut it back up and, and do other things with it. But he also had the thing, Fung, that you, that we're both talking about is that making was important for guiding the work, right? Because mm -hmm. he would always talk about doing this himself. And the reason why you do that, because that's where the decision making was was by the second, like minute, you know, like he was trying to figure it out within the frame mind of mind of the material. I thought that was really special. Yeah, it's a matter of alchemy. You're absolutely right uh, in that. So much of the the deployment of uh, acrylic was associated with the you know the the field paintings, right? The, you know the Washington School, Frankenthaler, Kenneth Nolan, not, but it less pay its emphasis on other African-American artists. You write Al is one of them, certainly Frank Bolin, even in England, yeah. Yeah. Sam and others. So you absolutely, right. but it's a matter of transformation, which is alchemy. So right. thank right. you so much. That's just hit, hit the, hit the, hit the. And William T. Williams, William T. who, who was a, a mentor of both Arthur Sims and, and myself. You, you'd always talk about alchemy. Yeah, it's super true. Can't wait to see the show. Uh, thank you, Nari. Congratulations. Thank you, Fong. Yeah, we'll be in touch. Yeah. Looking forward to talk to you about the big show too. Yes. Being in I'm, unison, just like come together. Great. I'm, yeah. I'm so much. Looking forward yeah. to it. Thank I, you. I, I call you later. Okay. Uh, thank you, Jessamyn. Back to you, Nick. Thank you. Thanks, Fong. Um, thank you, Fong, for that question. Uh, and, and a reminder to everyone, yes, to um, if you're in New York, if you're able to go see the show, is at Lehman Malpin on view until June 4th. So please do see it and congratulations, Neri. Um, here at The Rail, we have a tradition of ending our community events with a poetry reading. And today, today I'm thrilled to welcome our poet laureate, Benjamin Crustling to the stage. Benjamin is a writer and artist based in Brooklyn. He is the author of the book, Glaring and a doctoral candidate in English at CUNY. Uh, so Benjamin, the floor is yours. Thanks, Nick. And uh, thanks so much, Neri. It was really a pleasure to get acquainted with your work and to hear your uh, really capacious thoughts about it, which made me think about um, so much that I'm trying to work through in my own work. So um, I'll keep it short to close it out. Thanks, everyone, for staying. And thank you to Carolyn in particular for inviting me and Brooklyn Rail for having me. Um, I'm going to read three poems from this book, Glaring, uh, which tries to work through different kinds of problems of experience that relate to not only blackness in a lot of different modes, but public space, urban space and things like that. Um, and as I was listening to Neri talk about his work, I decided on a few poems that I think might glance off what we looked at and talked about in different, uh, maybe paratactic ways or something. So um, yes, thanks for having me and sticking around. Great. Friendship is roughly everywhere, thanks. The uniform person puts traffic cones down in neat rows, their bright orange, weeping. What's next is, I'm happy for your jazz concern. It's all sexual. And if I pushed it clear, we'd still be on the street, right inside the boundary. I'm so happy there's nothing going on. Soretta was right about winning. 
full of information, none glowing, synthetic color in the limbic motor. It's just people look so good when you trust them and you don't look. The artifact being thought the most beautiful thing. I thought I was near where Malcolm was shot. Then I realized I was wrong. We were blessed with these sensitivities, navigating a landscape that varies its networks of trouble, change over time. In fact, the building, which was not where I was, though I was near there, is decorated with terracotta, glazed polychromy, and crustaceans and cornices, gaudy colors in the Hellenistic style. My face, crushed against the wiki page on which I was reading this, collecting material for a treatment. I was there, having realized I was wrong and the memory of being somewhere else. Was I being spoken to, I wondered, not being the only voice possible in that area. The idea of violence from an old photograph, the setting someone up is digital. Weaving these things through one another as habit and then intent because I was scared and without equipment, navigating that gaudily, then that historical feeling, thinking one is where something happened that one is thinking about, then not being there, but feeling that. The world peopled as it is with hallucinations, justice not among them, but thought of also, experiencing conspiracy as a digital product, anxious, setting the scene while isolating the voice, people themselves being so small on the sidewalk, people themselves dying so violently, the memory of that hanging, as at that moment, I was having my small, different experience, heading more slowly and apparently elsewhere. Being young after all, looking upward as I'm describing myself at that time, and crustaceans looming. To heaven on a mule. My dream of heaven was an ice cream factory, but it echoed blackface heaven from a few minutes earlier. And all wishes, brained on the marvel of televised limbo, where production assistants line up lights and vanish, drag social pain into procedures that taste great on camera. People, in that sense, reviewing memory produces artifacts, long static renditions of blackface heaven, so they try to shred the bush years with vocal runs. It's a room with floor to ceiling mirrors and people spread their arms there to sing, to place the face at the center, to tell the world childhood is sweet, though it tastes like power over, though it tastes like pistachio. These are eyes I make the world so careful with, long static, long talk. Well, you say you want a strong feeling, have one or someone will think you're withholding. It's like fed logic, depression fighting escapism. Ch childhood is so sweet, they say, as they go house to house killing on a thick recursive loop. And their faces drip, they're wet with effort. And this is the last poem now, thank you again. They didn't know what they were smiling at. There was no image in the frame. Surely it's no accident. I'm drawn to a figure in the road, a yellow raincoat, it's manufactured, centers all vision, says, don't kill me in the rain, I trust you. This means something to us. This figure makes me up then a problem left untended. 
I push the image forward with cars, more rain, row houses, electric reds, blues, associated with work. There it was and not knowing itself. I imagine a person, the black sign themselves inside a raincoat. I watch them as they move through falling water, as the narrative spills, as it fails to show myself the one object of my desire. Inside the coat, it's yellow then. I cannot see a face. The face is so under. And I was paranoid, thinking how it would be me in that situation, against the cars in yellow, black, produced by the situation they anticipate. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Benjamin, for um, a perfect way to end today's event. Um, I once again would like to thank you, Neri. Thank you so much, Jessamine. Um, we'd like to thank Alejandro, Sarah, Amy, and the extended team at Lehman Malpin for helping to make uh, today's event possible. And over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has brought together art, music, dance, film, theater, literature, and thoughtful social and political meditations in our monthly publication and in our public events like here in our daily NSC. Uh, please check the chat. We'll post a link um, if you would like to donate to support our writers, editors, and operations here at the Rail. Join us tomorrow if you can for a special conversation at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, with Rosa Barba and Francesca Pietropalo on the event of Barba's show at uh, Gladstone Gallery here in New York. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by Lin Chu. You can now all turn on your microphones to say hello and goodbye and uh, wishing you all a happy Monday. Great. Thanks everyone. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Neri. Thanks, Neri. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Neri. Thank you, Neri. Thanks, Bob. Thank you all. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin, for the beautiful Thank reading. Yes, great. congratulations again, Neri. Thank and, you. Um, please go to see the show, you all. Please <laughs> Take care. see it in person. Thank you, Neri. Amazing. Yes. Thank you, Neri. Thank you, Benjamin. Thank you, guys. Thank you, you guys. Much love and courage. Keep Much up love. the good work. Yes. Take and care. And let's go to have lunch. <laughs> Take care. Be safe, everyone. Okay. Bye-bye now. Bye. Thank you. Bye.